we give you our own Josh Hansen. Good morning. And also to you. <laughs> Before I begin, I got to say, it's such an honor to be up here with this panel, and it feels a little bit like, I don't know if any of you watched Sesame Street or Red Highlights when you were kids. There's like three kids playing with a red rubber ball, and then there's a kid out in the field picking flowers. And I feel a little bit like that with uh, the panel that I'm speaking with today. But I'm incredibly grateful for being up here. You've heard Carrie speak about how initially I was skeptical about CFDSI, and this is in fact true. I was skeptical that any intervention in such a short period of time could yield the results that Carrie and Dr. Marin spoke about. But upon implementing CFDSI with a couple of families, it was clear that their confidence was not misplaced. You've heard the word hope used a lot this morning, and I think it's appropriate. It's in the title of the event that we're here for today. Because CFDSI is absolutely about hope, but not in any disembodied or ambiguous way, but in a very real and practical way. CFDSI provides families with a roadmap for recovery. It's about giving families the tools and skills to manage the aftermath of trauma, about dispelling their sense of hopelessness and powerlessness, and about fostering a stronger sense of communication and connection within the families. Today, I'm going to tell you about one of my clients, a wonderful 10-year-old girl who I'm going to call Keisha, and her mother, who I'm going to call Miss Johnson. About a year ago, in the spring of 2011, Keisha came to us at the Brooklyn Child Advocacy Center after she told a school guidance counselor that she was being sexually abused by her uncle. The abuse had occurred on a weekly basis for about a year while her uncle babysat Keisha. Keisha hadn't told her mother about the abuse because Keisha's uncle had threatened to hurt both Keisha and her mother if she did. In the aftermath of her disclosure, her uncle was arrested by a detective from NYPD's Brooklyn Child Abuse Squad and prosecuted by a, dist a district attorney from the Brooklyn Crimes Against Children Bureau. Working jointly, we put a plan in place to ensure for Keisha's safety, and this is where we began CFTSI. When I first saw Keisha in the waiting area, she looked like she was trying to disappear. She was a tall and skinny, disheveled child in oversized gray sweats. She was slumped down in her chair, her head was down, her arms were folded over her chest, and her body language expressed a disquieting combination of stay away from me and please help me. Keisha was sitting next to her mother, but they weren't communicating, and there was clearly a divide between them. One of the things I love about CFTSI is that right from the beginning, it demystifies trauma. The structured conversation I had with Keisha's mother served to open up a dialogue about trauma's effects and afforded me an opportunity to normalize Keisha's reactions as typical and somewhat logical. Bringing Ms. Johnson into this active posture was the first step in Keisha's recovery process and began to impart the sense that not only could things be better, but that Keisha and her mother were going to be essential parts of making it better. In the first session, Keisha's mother detailed the gradual changes in Keisha that had resulted in dramatic differences. She said that before her abuse, Keisha was an outgoing and charismatic nine-year-old girl. But where Keisha had been social and outgoing, her mother reported she'd been, become sullen, withdrawn, and didn't want to spend time with friends or family. Keisha's school, school performance had changed as well, and teachers reported that where Keisha had once been an active participant in class with excellent grades, she'd become withdrawn, rarely completed homework assignments, and was at risk of failing her courses and being held back. Ms. Johnson reported that even Keisha's manner of dress had changed from where she would wear typical nine-year-old outfits to where now she would only wear overly baggy clothes, and even getting Keisha to shower had become a struggle. She said she felt like her daughter was slipping away from her, and that now that she knew what happened, these behaviors made more sense, but she still didn't know what to do to bring her daughter back to her. She said that whenever she tried to help, Keisha would push her away. The more she tried to help, the more Keisha pushed her away. Keisha's mother reported she felt like she was walking on eggshells around her own daughter. In the aftermath of abuse, families can also struggle with fears about how abuse can change their, ch their child's future. Keisha's mother spoke about how her uncle had stolen Keisha's innocence and expressed a sense of despair that things could never be the same. She also said that in the aftermath of Keisha's disclosure, it felt like they'd been swept up in a whirlwind of meetings and appointments and that they were reliving what had happened over and over again with the end result being that they felt further and further apart. 
Ms. Johnson told me that the abuse was on Keisha's mind all the time, no matter what they tried. She said she tried to keep Keisha busy so that she wouldn't have to think about it, but that Keisha had become unwilling to spend time with her mother and had retreated to her room and listened to music. She said Keisha was having difficulty going to sleep and often would stay up until 2 or 3 in the morning or later, but she didn't know why. It was clear from my conversation with Ms. Johnson that it had been as much a struggle for her as it had been for Keisha. Watching her daughter struggle while not knowing how to help her left Ms. Johnson feeling hopeless and powerless. When I spoke to Keisha, she reported much the same reactions as her mother. Keisha, however, was able to talk about things that she hadn't shared with her mother, and together we began to help her reactions make sense. She said that she didn't like to talk about what happened because she just wanted to forget about it. She, led, she said this led to her withdrawing more and more from her mother, and that while it was difficult to talk about the abuse, she also felt guilty because she knew her mother loved her and cared about her and wanted to help her, but she didn't know how to bridge the divide and start talking about the abuse. Keisha said she was sad and that she cried a lot, but that she didn't want to worry her mother, so she retreated to her room. Keisha also told me that she was interrupted constantly throughout her day with memories of the abuse. She said as a result of these memories, she had difficulty falling asleep, and that when she was able to get to sleep, she had nightmares. The nightmares woke Keisha up several times throughout the night, and the cumulative effect of her difficulty falling asleep and her difficulty staying asleep was that she was constantly exhausted. Being so tired was affecting her ability to concentrate in school the next day. It's hard to share with you the sense of hopelessness and powerlessness that Keisha conveyed in her words and body language. Her primary reactions had been confounded with secondary reactions like shame and guilt at not being able to talk to her mother and failing school. Her reactions were slowly crowding out all that was uniquely her, all the ways she was positively connected to her world. Before we finished the first half of session two, I spoke to Keisha about if she felt comfortable sharing what she'd shared with me with her mother. Keisha's eyes got wide. She was clearly reluctant, and she looked like I just told her she was going to have to wrestle a bear. She said she was worried that her mother would get upset by hearing about the things Keisha had shared and that she'd shared them with me and not her mother. I reminded Keisha that her mother loved her very much and only wanted to support her and that wherever they had difficulty, I would be there to support them. Keisha agreed that she would try. When Keisha, her mother, and I met together, we started off with a discussion about how it's clear that Keisha and her mother loved one another very much and how important each was to the other. We talked about how hard it is for parents and children to talk about abuse because they're both scared of saying something that's going to hurt the other's feelings. Keisha's mother did an exceptionally beautiful job in supporting Keisha. Throughout the discussion of Keisha's reactions, she was attentive and supportive. At one point, Keisha was hanging her head. She was slumped down in her chair. Her voice had gotten very soft, and she was starting to cry. I checked in with Keisha if she was OK and made eye contact with Ms. Johnson. Ms. Johnson immediately slid her chair over next to Keisha and put her arm around her daughter. Keisha began to cry. Keisha's mother, with her arm around Keisha, rubbing her back, said, I love you, and it's going to be OK. This moment demarcated a dramatic shift in our work together, a demonstration of the support that Keisha was so desperately craving but was unable to ask for, and a demonstration that her mother would be behind Keisha no matter what happened. By the end of this conversation, both Keisha and her mother looked lighter. They continued to sit next to one another for the remainder of the session and, and hold hands. CFDSI had provided the context and direction for the conversation that so desperately needed to happen provided an opening for Keisha's mother to demonstrate that she was there for Keisha unconditionally. Another piece that I love about CFTSI is that it's an active, solution-focused intervention. People want to be mobilized. They want to feel like they have an active role in addressing their reactions. At the end of session two, we came up with a plan to do just that. We decided together that the primary area for concern was that memories of her abuse were derailing Keisha throughout the day. We discussed ways to help, help this, and Keisha reported that previously she'd been a part of a, a social skills group in school and that in the group they'd used a breathing exercise to help calm them down whenever they were scared or anxious or angry. Keisha demonstrated the exercise for her mother and I in session. We decided to develop this breathing exercise into a breathing and visualization exercise. 
to help crowd out her intrusive thoughts and to help her fall asleep each night. Together we brainstormed to come up with an example of a place where Keisha had felt safe and secure in the past. For her, this was at her grandmother's house in Virginia. We embellished the visualization with as much sensory detail as possible, adding in what the house looked like, the smells and tastes of her grandmother's cooking, and what it felt like to be held close by her mother and her grandmother. Keisha even hugged herself as we were practicing, reinforcing her own sense of safety and her own active role in her recovery. Ms. Johnson participated in the activity with us as well and committed to practice with Keisha each night before she went to sleep. Another thing I like to include in our plan together is a family activity that reinforces the relationship between the caregiver and child and gives the child something to look forward to in her week. It also reinforces the importance of fun in the client's recovery. Keisha and her mother reported that they used to enjoy going to the movies together, but that they hadn't done this in a while. They said that this was a realistic goal for the coming week, and together they chose a comedy that was currently in theaters and committed to go before the next session. Both Carrie and Dr. Marins have spoke about how critical the case management component is to CFTSI, and this case is a wonderful illustration of that. As a clinician, I've seen that some of the most helpful and healing interventions take place outside of the counseling space. Keisha told me that while she spent a great deal of time in her room, her room was also where the abuse had occurred. So her room itself served as a reminder of the abuse. Keisha's case manager was able to secure funds through the Office of Victims Assistance to help Keisha and her mother purchase a new bedroom set and to redecorate Keisha's room. This simple, concrete change helped support the clinical interventions and contribute to the shift we were trying to make in Keisha's life. When I saw Keisha and her mother in the waiting area before the third session, it was clear that things were already different. They were talking together and smiling. And before I could even check in regarding Keisha's week, she excitedly reported she'd been using the visualization exercise during school and at home, though she said she didn't hug herself in school because in her words, she didn't want to look like a weirdo. <laughs> as a result, she reported things were much better. You could hear the pride in Keisha's voice as she talked about how she'd begun to manage her own reactions. Ms. Johnson told me that they'd practice the exercise as Keisha went to bed and that she stayed with her until Keisha fell asleep. She, said that even for, she even said for the last couple nights, Keisha had told her that she was okay, and Ms. Johnson had left, her, left Keisha to fall asleep on her own. They said they'd gone to movies together, they had gone to the movie together, and in telling me about their going, they both had smiles from ear to ear, and Keisha was laughing, which was the first time I heard her infectious laugh. The only symptom that had persisted was the nightmares, which had reduced but not abated completely. This is often the case, as in the clients I've worked with, uh, Nightmares tend to be the most stubborn symptom. We, we agreed that Keisha would continue to practice the exercise throughout her week as necessary. In the fourth and final session, Keisha came in with even more changes. She ditched her sweats and she was dressed up. When I asked her about the change, she said that she and her mother were going out for a dinner and movie date after the session to celebrate completion of CFTSI. Keisha said she only had to use the visualization exercise twice that week and each time only briefly. She said she'd had no nightmares that week, down from several a night in the beginning. I'm not terribly sentimental, but it was hard, to get, hard not to get emotional as Keisha's mother stopped me several times in this session to express how grateful she was to have her daughter back. For her part, Keisha demonstrated her sense of humor by saying we were going to have to brainstorm an intervention for her mom because she was crying so much in the final <laughs> session. In the final assessment, Keisha's symptoms had gone from a score of 32 to a six. Keisha's mother's assessment reported Keisha's symptoms had gone from a 28 to a seven. While this is an exceptionally successful CFTSI case, the results are not at all atypical. I think every clinician who has been fortunate enough to utilize CFTSI has several Keishas that they can tell you about. For those clients whose reactions prove more persistent, Dr. Marins and Carrie would be the first to tell you that the intervention is not designed to be a panacea but that for the children who require additional services, CFTSI helps make therapy less scary and serves as a bridge to future services. At the Brooklyn CAC, we're blessed to be partnered with our exceptional sister program, the Safe Horizon Counseling Center, to continue the work with these children. Finally, I want to leave you with this. I often think about where Keisha and other children like her would be today without CFTSI. I envision hospitalizations, unnecessary medications, and worse. Without an intervention like CFTSI, these children will have a very different life. 
Perhaps the best argument for an intervention like CFTSI is in the statement we hear time and time again from caregivers who have their own history of abuse. They lament that an intervention like CFTSI wasn't available to them when they were children. They share that their reactions have now become a difficult part of their life that they still work to overcome. I hope that we can all work together to make this intervention available to any child whose life is touched by abuse and to help ensure that they have the future they deserve. Thank you for your time.